So, hi everybody, my name is Linda Caranzalis, and I am a board certified cognitive specialist, former special education teacher uh, with over 25 years experience, and I'm here today to talk to you about communicating with your child's teacher. I want to share with you that I'm going to give you both perspectives as a professional um, and also as a person, an adult with ADHD, growing up with ADHD, and also a nonverbal learning disorder. Many people haven't heard of a nonverbal learning disorder, but it means you're highly verbal. It's just a terrible name and um, you don't pick up like a lot of cues. But, you know, and I'll talk about that a little bit during the um, presentation. So you can, uh, if you want to learn more about me, you can go to my website, advantageslearningcenter.com. That's with two Ds because it is an advantage. Um, I work with parents. I train them. Um, how to better manage their kids. I teach social skills training, parent training, and I do a lot of brain training for independent learning and executive functioning skills, which goes really to the root of the cause, not, you know, just like strategies on times tests, sitting to the front of the room, but more like what's underneath those skills so that you can learn independently. So, for example, if you have long-term memory problems and you work on long-term memory and all this transfers over. So that's just a little bit about me. Um, so this is our part one, communicating with your child's teacher. And next week is going to be part two, which will get more in depth about what you can do with your child's teacher. But for now, we're just going to start with um, supporting with in light of COVID. Th this is unprecedented. There's no other school year like this, as you know. There's been such an impact on um, instructional, logistics, emotional. So this is not, you can't really expect back to business to school as normal this year. Um, it's gonna be the major focus this year is reacclimating to school. The focus will be on social emotional learning, building relationships within a community and teachers really taking the time to learn about their students because last year, I mean, kids were sitting in front of a computer screen for, you know, 15 to 18 months, some kids were hybrid learning, doing both, some were all online, and the teachers really didn't get to know the kids that well with all this stress and all this chaos. And um, so this year's gonna be really different because they don't really have the knowledge from the previous year's teacher to say, hey, you know, can you tell me a little bit about this kid because of last year? Um, so that's gonna be a big difference. Um, it's going to be, uh, you know, it's not going to be academics right away. Probably not until the typical school year, like the end of September, it's getting to know the kids academically where they are. But it might not be till the beginning of November because they don't just want to test these kids right away. They have to make them feel safe because we still have COVID. A lot of the kids are anxious. They may be worrying about you at home. So all this is, I'm telling you this because this helps you to support the teacher because you may just be chomping at the bit. I wanna to get to the IEP and the 504 because we had such a learning loss and you may wanna just get right to that, but unfortunately that's not what's gonna happen and that's not for optimal learning. You need to have the social emotional learning environment set to learn or you can't learn. So that's gonna be first and foremost this school year. There will be a huge learning curve and these assessments will happen later on. So what can you do what you really want to do is let the teacher know that you know that it's really tough. We've all been through COVID and that you know that this year is different. So you're giving them a lot of empathy to letting them know that right off the bat. Um, you want to let them know that, you know, your child may have mental health concerns. Maybe there was a death in the family with COVID or someone's really sick or there's a job loss and, you know, there's difficulties financially. Um, you know, so you might want to let them know that because that's going to affect your child's learning or behavior or building, you know, with learning within a community because that's what the focus is, is on is learning now within a community, back in the building, back in school. Um, so all that's going to affect your child's relationship with everyone at school. And so you need to convey this to the teacher. And I'm going to get to that, how you're going to do that. Okay. Um, so a lot of kids really did, you know, it was both sides of the fence. So some kids survived and some kids thrived. So the kids that survived 
you know, they really had a hard time learning. They really missed their friend. And some were in the middle, of course. It's not all black or white. Um, those kids, you know, I had a lot of kids I was working online with, and they would have meltdowns, ADHD kids, and they just couldn't learn. They really needed to be in the classroom, especially with everybody at home under one roof. So these kids are kind of wanting to go back, um, and they want to see their friends. But it's still going to be an adjustment because of the structure, because of routine, time management. All that was out the window at home with everybody under one roof. Um, so that, I would say, is for the kids that were surviving are maybe looking a little bit more forward to going back. But they're still nervous. All kids are still nervous because it's just kind of like I know teachers that have been teaching for 30 years and they're still nervous on the first day of school. You want everything to go right. So kids have kind of forgotten how to be students. Um, and you want to let the teacher know all of this, that you are on the same page with them and you know what it's like to be in their shoes. Um, a lot of teachers, um, parents, this was a real eye opener for them as well. Um, but let me, I'm back, I'm going a little bit ahead. Let me go back to the kids that thrived. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So the kids that thrived, they're the kids that may be nervous to go back because these kids may have been bullied and they were getting a reprieve from all the bullying and the social emotional stuff that I, they had to face every day. And the kids that, um, you know, with the transitions and they were able to have some autonomy at home with some parent support and they were able to do everything on the computer and they didn't have to worry about distractions, doing all the neurotypical stuff, sensory overload. So these kids thrived at home and a lot of them don't want to go back. They're nervous too. Or some kids, it just wasn't plain easier at home. You know, things were a lot easier. Um, you know, there maybe wasn't that much teaching going on with all the stress and they really don't want to go back. So you have a range and a continuum of where the kids are coming from. Um, and some of the kids did so well that many of you might be on here doing some um, homeschooling also with some part time teachers that maybe you've hired, that's been an option too, because a lot of the kids and parents realize how well they did at home. So regardless, um, you know, that's where they are. And I think all kids, what I saw was they felt less stigmatized, that they didn't have to conform to neurotypical standards and they could kind of just be more of themselves, even if learning at home was hard. So I would say be patient. If there's anything you can do to help them, let them know, you know, hand sanitizers, uh, tissues, if they need any help with preparation, anything that you can do, following up with your structure at home and letting them know that you are doing your part at home. I always said to the teachers, I'll believe half of what I hear about home if you believe half of what, you know, vice versa, what you hear about school, because you really, um, you just really don't know and you both need to be partners in this. They have, they're in charge of the IEP, which is a big responsibility. And so parents also need to do their part. I'm giving you both sides of the fence. So um, going to go now. So you need to, of course they need to know about your child and you're gonna convey that, but you need to know the profile of the teacher because the more you know about the teacher, the better your child is going to do in school. What are their beliefs? Do they believe in ADHD? Unfortunately, in this day and age, many teachers do not. They may only understand if they themselves have ADHD or they have kids that have ADHD or they have family members that have ADHD. And of course, there's some that don't have the personal background, but they know about ADHD. So you're gonna have to, you probably already know that now that you're a couple weeks in. So what are their beliefs? You need to know what you're up against. So how you're gonna manage that. Um, do they have the knowledge? Um, they may believe in ADHD, but maybe they don't have all the knowledge about it, but they just know because it's a buzzword and they know what they need to do. But maybe they don't have all the knowledge how to help your child, even though they know about ADHD. Maybe they don't know exactly what to do to help your child in the way that you know they would benefit from. Um, you could get a burned out teacher. This might be the last year that, and they've had it with COVID. And they might just be looking to get through the year to retire. Okay, you need to know, figure that out somehow. It's usually general knowledge so that you're going to have to provide more scaffolding at home. Okay, do the teachers have not just the knowledge, you know, the book knowledge, but have they had also like some kind of hands-on training or somebody coming into the school? Um, 
to teach them other than what they've learned on their own, on their own initiative. Um, if not, then you can talk to and see if you can get somebody to come into the school. And Chad has a lot of great resources that you can share with the teacher. So you kind of need to know who your teacher is. Just like every year, you need to know, do they do tests from the book or is it everything from the notes? Um, do they do spelling reviews before the spelling test at the end of the week? And if they do, that means that maybe you can emphasize other things at home, get them other classes that they, your child may need help in. So you really need to know what they, um, what kind of like how they operate. That way you can help your child be successful. Um, even if you feel your child isn't getting right away the needs from the, you know, from the IEP or the 504 plan, you may already feel like that now. I encourage you, because it's a different school year, to kind of wait and again, have the empathy and let them get through what they have to get through with the assessments. And next week, we're gonna talk about more about the education piece. Um, so don't just go to the child study team yet or talk to somebody. Let Hang in there for a little bit longer. Um, so this is something that I created. Um, that if you email me, I can send you a link online. And this is a profile. Um, I, I see that there's a typo here, so I have to fix that for neurodivergence. So I will fix that. But just like, you know, you need to know the teacher's profile is it that they need to know about your child. And so it doesn't really matter what grade your child's in, because even if they're in like high school, you know, these teachers may be just teaching the content area and they have so many kids on their roster that they, this will really help them out to remember because there's a lot of things to remember when you have a lot of students. So you can put their picture up there because that really helps them stand out to the teacher. Um, you can, in this, I put in this paragraph here, you know, you want to be positive in this paragraph. You want to give like maybe what your vision is for your child, what you expect, or, you know, like I have here that, you know, Johnny can be a quirky kid but he gets along with his classmates and teachers. It's important that they take medication. You know, kids don't want to be singled out and have to go to the, you know, to the nurse's office and everybody's like, oh, he's taking or she's taking their medication. So anything that you feel is real, I would put the positive first because you want to build a positive relationship. You want them to look forward to working with your child and they already know your child a little bit, but this is really you and how you're going to interact with them and what the relationship between you and the teacher. So they're going to know that, you know what, this is the parent that's going to work with me that went to the time to prepare this and send this in to me, shows me that I have a parent that's on my side and that's going to work with me. So this will go a long way. Um, so you're going to tailor this to your child because you can change this online when I send this to you. Um, so again, it's showing that the, the communication door is open. So in that first paragraph, again, start out positive and then if there's something that you feel that they really need to know like medication or maybe your child's depressed from COVID or has a lot of anxiety. Many things happen to people during COVID, many different situations. Some people were displaced from their homes. Um, you need to put that in there. If your child's depressed, they may think your child's just not motivated and doesn't want to learn. Or if your child has anxiety, which is already very common with ADHD, then you can imagine the anxiety that you're seeing now for some of your kids that it's through the roof. So the teacher needs to know that as well, that it may not just be a behavior problem, that it could be stemming from anxiety as well or depression. So anything that you feel that needs to go in there. Um, so you can also put in here about COVID. I know it's not a lot of space, but you can put, you know, they're excited to coming back to school because they miss their friends, or you could put maybe they're not so excited because things were easier at home or they're afraid about being bullied. Something like that pertaining to COVID in the first paragraph. So then you have here, my struggles. So these are just examples that I put in, but you know your child's struggles um, and you can change any of these. So, you know, if the child is, if your child's interrupting or has a hard time making friends, you know, then your teacher has a heads up. They can maybe sit them with a buddy at lunch or somebody next to them that's helpful in the classroom, in the next seat. Um, if they have a hard time getting out of their seat, they can give them jobs to do, but they just need to know what all the struggles are. And they may, your struggles may be some of these, but they may look different as well. Um, 
like for loud sounds, that's really important for the teacher to know so that the child can have a heads up, of, we're going to have a fire drill, uh, because that can be really upsetting for some kids. Um, so you want to put what your child loves, because that gives the teacher, again, a chance to build a relationship knowing what the things that your child likes, especially if your child is doesn't, you know, speak that much. Like, you know, a lot of kids with ADHD aren't just hyper or impulsive. They can be more spacey and daydreaming. They may not talk a lot and they may slip through the cracks and the teacher may think they don't need that much help from me because the kids that, ha that have the greater needs that appears to be with more attentional problems take more of their time. So you um, want to try to foster and, and help your child build that relationship. You can also, another thing you can do is have your child write a letter or, you know, be creative. Some of them like to make videos. They're real techie online. They, some may want to make a little video about themselves and what they feel like about going back to school. Others might think that's just weird, depending on your kid. Um, so, or they can write something to the teacher, you know, hey, you know, I'm not that excited about coming back to school, but, you know, these are the things I like. I really don't like to do homework, but I'll try my best. Or, you know, anything to let the teacher know who they are, what they like. And then, of course, you're going to oversee that and have a lot of positives in there as well. Um, so you can also do, whoops, what doesn't work. Okay, I have a lot of these things are really, really common. So time constraints. So child may need extra time. Some kids, time constraints doesn't work. Sometimes too much time is not a good thing because then they have too much time on their hands and they're getting distracted, maybe getting into trouble. So, or they have a hard time getting started when they have too much time. So they need, may need a timer or they need something discreet like a, like a, like a cue or, you know, the teacher can do like a cue, like tap them or something. It depends on your child if they need more time or less time. Sudden changes, um, nor typical expectations is a big one because we all, you know, in the Norder divergent community, I mean, everybody looks the same. It's not like you're in a wheelchair and you can see that there's something wrong. I mean, when you have a physical illness, especially with cancer or something, people, and that's not to downplay it, people are like, oh, they're sending casseroles over. Oh, they're going out of their way to help you. They're calling and they're asking you for help. But it's not like that with an invisible disability or disorder such as with ADHD, um, you may not get a lot of empathy and the teacher may really just hold your child to neurotypical standards. That's why I like this on here because you're telling them right away, they might not even know what neurotypical is or neurodivergent. Um, you're letting them know right away that this is where you're coming from and this is what you expect, um, that they do acknowledge them, that they may think or do things differently and that that's okay, um, that we're not all, you know, from a cookie cutter approach here. So these are all things, um, a lot of teachers will say, you know, you have to look me in the eye to pay attention. I'm sure you've encountered that. And that doesn't mean that you're not listening. A lot of kids, you know, they can be doodling, they can be, you know, looking out the window. And some, of course, aren't, but many do pay attention that way. So it's not always eye contact is the best way to show that you're listening. So that would be a neurotypical standard to me. Um, that if the teacher didn't allow that someone to doodle. So you're gonna learn all these things about the teacher. Um, taking away recess definitely doesn't work. We all know that. Um, so you already know based on the history of your child what you can fill in here and what you can do. Um, I don't know how much time we have because I'm trying to talk fast because Trish, are you there? How much more time do we have? have has it been 15 minutes? Um, it's 323, but take your time. Okay. Okay. So, um, one of the things that, um, you know, some things that you can do is what I would recommend is to say to the teacher, look, I know it's been a rough year with COVID. I'm here. Anything that I can do to help you. And you can even tell them one thing that you learned during COVID because parents really have had an eye opener as to what it's been like to educate their child at home. And a lot of parents have a new respect for teachers now. And not that they some didn't before, but they really get it now. I mean, they have maybe two or three kids at home and, and they understand now that the teacher has, you know, a whole classroom of kids. So to say, you know what, I really, you know, I really learned this year. One thing about teaching during COVID is I learned this. So you're letting them know what it's like to be in their shoes. If you're frustrated, tell them you're frustrated. Say, you know, I was really frustrated when 
Johnny or Susie came home with 30 math problems and, you know, it's in the 504 plan that, you know, he or she is to do half. You want to stick to the facts and not let your emotions get in the way and always give the teacher the benefit of the doubt because you want to be on the right foot having good communication. Don't put egg on their face, for lack of a better term. Give them an out and say, you know, um, I know it's really busy and you probably forgot. And that way it gives them an opportunity to do what needs to be done for your child. Um, ask the teacher, like, what's really important for you as a classroom teacher? What do you expect of your students and how can I help you? And you'll find out if it's something that your child has difficulty with from having ADHD, and then you can share that. Or maybe it's something that um, just expects, you know, respect across the board or whatever. Then you can assure the teacher that that's important to you, and I'm going to work on that. And this is what's important to me. And that gives you an opener because maybe you don't care about your child getting A's. Maybe social skills are more important. And we all know that having a mentally healthy child is much more than having a child that gets an A. And that's how important it is in life. So maybe they don't know that. Maybe they think you're all about grades and they focus on that. So they really need to know because then they can focus more on the social aspect. But many don't know unless you tell them. So by, by um, sharing expectations, that's a good way to get the conversation going. Um, also, let them know that you do value, I mean, they are teachers, they have education, and that you don't have all the answers, and that you say, well, what do you think we could do and problem solve, and then take some of their suggestions so that they know that they're being respected for their profession, and then you can say, hey, we tried this. It worked. It didn't work. Can we tweak it? Um, and then acknowledge the challenges that you face as well. You know what? My child can get on my every last nerve at home. Sometimes I have to repeat myself because he, he or she has poor auditory processing 10 times or for them to pull away and come to the dinner table. And let's know that you they don't think, you know, that you think your kid's perfect and that it doesn't have any issues, that you are, yourself are frustrated too. And you're not just expecting them not to be frustrated because we all have feelings and we all get frustrated and teachers get frustrated. So you're joining in with them to see how they see things from their point of view. And let them know that, you know what, I expect there to be good and bad days. There's gonna be some bad days, there's gonna be some good days at home and at school, and we're gonna work on it together. That way, you know, when your child has a bad day, they're not afraid, oh my gosh, Mr. And Mrs. So-and-so, this happened in school today, it's gonna to be like a, you know, I have to contact them. But that you, you know, you know that there's good and bad days and that you have reasonable expectations and that this is a work in progress. How do we learn more about the teacher and their beliefs? You, you're going to have to pay attention to their language, too, to see what their beliefs are. If they say to you, I mean, you're going to be like a detective. Well, if, if he would, she would just pay attention. Well, hello. You don't want to tell a kid with ADHD, just pay attention or just focus. You're going to know by the way they speak. You're going to observe by the way that they speak. So that's a clue. You're going to see if they're rigid or if they're inflexible. You're going to, their behavior is going to tell you. So, and then that's going to let you know, hmm, you're going to have to try to communicate with that teacher and see if you can meet you know, educate them and if they're going to work with you, um, and, you know, let them know. And, I, you know, you get more bees with honey. Let them send in hand lotion, send them in cookies, stuff that they can use throughout the day that's, that knows that it came from you and that you care and that, that, believe it or not, that's going to help them be more empathetic and work with you and your child. But um, try not to listen to other people's beliefs throughout parents because, you know, there could be one teacher, I've had this happen, one teacher could not could have not have her teacher, her child in this teacher's room, and another one couldn't in another teacher's room, and they switched, and those teachers were exactly what they needed for those kids. So try not to let be tainted by anybody else's opinions, because we all have different personalities, and what works for one teacher style may not work. I told the teacher I can share a one-page introduction about my children, but she said no thanks. Um, she'll wait until she receives the IEP. Try to stick to the facts 
and not let your anger show. Um, I would send it in anyway, and I would put a little note. Um, oh, I know that you said, you know, you wanted to look at the IP, but I just wanted, you know, to give you my perspective as a parent as well, because not a lot of things that you can tell from an IP by a child's personality. The IP is just objectives of academics that you're going to work on. So this is a relationship that doesn't sound right now that the teacher's very open, but again, I would say, I understand, I would try to join in, I mean, even if you don't like, I would join in and say, I understand you have a lot of kids and I'm sure that's difficult to meet all of their needs, you know, and especially getting back to school with COVID. Try to let them see that you can, if, see if you can forge a pathway in there, if you can get in there somehow and create some new territory. I would still send it in anyway. I love this handout. Do we send this after a few months of hanging in there or right now as school is starting? I would send it right now because everything right now is social, emotional, building relationships, reacclimation. These kids are scared. They're building, you know, they're trying to get the kids to feel safe, getting used to be back in school. And your kid's anxiety may be up. I would send this in right now because next week we're going to talk about how you're going to address the academics and and really getting things to gel in the school year. And that we could talk about next week. My child was recently diagnosed with ADHD and I'm not sure what he needs to perform at school. She says, what tips to give them to help him? Okay, first I would start with what worked with last year's teacher and maybe last year's not a great year, but I don't know how old your child is, but what has worked in previous years that you know? Why reinvent the wheel? if? If you know certain things really do help, I would share that and I would put that in here in this piece of paper here, what works. Um, and you can also share what does what works for you. I had this one parent, child would get really upset. What her her child would get frustrated really easily at home and you know would want to just start, you know, acting out a little bit, like huffing and puffing, not throwing things, but it really not, not, I, I can't say that it was um, physical, I didn't, huffing and puffing wasn't the word, just upset, having like a meltdown, not wanting to quit. And she used, this was a younger kid, and she used the word strawberry, and said, and the kid would just start saying strawberry. It's one of those strawberry moments. That's what worked for her kid. So if you have something that works at home, of course, you don't want the teacher to say that in front of everybody, but if, if the, your child knows that the teacher knows that, then he's going to feel safe that, okay, you know, this teacher knows that sometimes I get a little upset. And if the teacher knows that and knows that word and can just kind of say it, then the, it'll help your child to calm down. That might not, that's a simplistic example, but what works for you at home with your child? Do you know, are there certain rewards that work at home? Is there a certain treat that your child likes? Is there something that if your child does at school, um, that you can say, you know, and I don't know what it is, if it's going to be academics or behavior for you that you can reinforce at home through school. But what, what you know that works, because you know your child better than anybody else. And, you know, so they're getting to know your child now, but you have a whole different perspective. I would say bridge that gap between home and school. Um, my teacher is not flexible. My son was tapping his foot and she called him out very strict and rigid and she's concerned for her child well first of all that's just plain wrong in my opinion well it is wrong it's not my opinion it's wrong so you need to you, you know what you can do you can talk to the teacher or email and you can say obviously this teacher doesn't know a lot about adhd um, again you want to be positive it's the beginning of the school year maybe send some fidgets in you can order them on amazon and just say, um, you know, and I don't know if the teacher told the parent this directly or the child just came home and said it, but whatever, just say, you know, my child has a hard time fidgeting, you can put it on this paper. And sometimes it can be distracting to others. Sometimes the ADHD kids really are distracting to others and it bothers the other students and they can't focus. So I don't know exactly what transpired. You don't, we weren't there. Again, we wanna give the benefit of the doubt and maybe go in with some of these fidgets and just say, hey, can you try this? And maybe give an article about fidgets or something. Um, and if the teacher is inflexible and doesn't wanna work with you at that point, 
then you might have to get the guidance counselor involved. But please, I would not do that right away. I would try to do everything on your own because once it gets to that point with the child study team and the principals, it gets harder. You really want to try to work this out with the teacher. Um, and just to further elaborate, she says um, she claims she called out the entire class and that she also requested an accommodation uh, to bring a carpet pad and the principal and teacher didn't appear supportive of her child in the email back to her. I would say she has to meet with the teacher and the principal then at this and, you know, not because that's really hard to communicate. It was in an email. If it's, you know, you really need to talk. Emails do not solve everything. You really, I think you need to talk, at least make a phone call. Um, how much should I expect from a high school teacher? Some teachers um, really are really not seem to be believing about the mental health, mental health needs. Well, you know, I would contact the school because I think it's called CARES. You might be familiar with this. They, they, there is federal funding for mental health issues since COVID now. And they're supposed to have more resources and more money. Is there any counseling available or anything? The guidance counselor, has she gone to the guidance counselor? Because there's a lot of mental health issues this year, you know, and there are anyway, but then on top of COVID, there is more money there. How do we know how much we can expect from the school? How much um, can they realistically do so I know how far to encourage progress? Is, this is academics, I would assume. I'm assuming. You have an IEP. Well, I think everything has to be spelled out in the IEP, exactly what the goals are, and you have to agree to that. Um, but you do need help outside of school. I, I, I mean, unfortunately, ADHD is very expensive when you have these issues because they can't meet all the needs. Um, so you're going to have to gauge it and see, you know, does what's going on in school? Are they learning? I mean, it's it's unfortunately there's been a huge learning loss with COVID and these kids, a lot of kids have already just got the short end of the stick um, because they've already struggled. And now on top of that with COVID. So you may need to go out and get some extra help because the school can't always provide everything that you may need. Uh, my son's teacher asked us to wait a few months before letting her know what works with our son. She wants to get to know him first. Is this normal? Meaning, is this normal for a teacher, teacher to respond like this? Sometimes, you know, somebody, a teacher can re respond like that because there are kids that are fine during the school day. And I don't know, some here may have that and they go home and explode with ADHD because they've held it in all day. And it may look to the teacher like they're just fine. Or it could be the kid is, your kid's exploding in school and having, not exploding, but just having a really hard, hard time adjusting and then coming home and being okay. So I get that that's what is this teacher saying. Again, I would let the teacher do that. I would still send this this in, thought this could be, you know, maybe helpful, but um, that she may want to get her own impression first and it may not be accurate as well. I mean, home and school are two different locations, but let's, start out there and then try to you know see what she comes up with and then you can give your feedback how long does it the teacher want i would say a reasonable amount of time not a few weeks the next question is and i know this is um we've had this question before and it's a complicated answer uh, but for those that are new to adhd and maybe their child has just been recently diagnosed can you provide a very brief explanation as to what an iep and maybe a section 504 plan is? Uh, sure yeah. yeah an iep is one and um is a plan and i think that varies in different states what they call them but your child has been diagnosed been assessed by the child study team and determined to have a learning disability adhd is not truly a learning disability it's a little hairy because it can be considered a developmental disability as well in the medical world, but um, it doesn't mean that it's a learning disability. And if your child is not struggling, if, if you're working so hard with your child every day after school and they don't see the struggle, they may not want to evaluate your child so that you can get the IV. And, and that, I'm going a little bit off, but it is a little complicated. So um, sometimes you may have to stop helping so that they can, no parent wants to do that. But you can't sit beside your child every night for hours and hours and hours 
just so that he or she can keep up in school and then they don't see that there's a problem and then you're not going to get the evaluation. Um, once you have the evaluation and your child has been determined to have a learning disability, which is not ADHD, then they will adjust the objectives of what your child needs to learn in school and how they're going to teach them to meet their needs that's individualized. Now, ADHD can come under a, a medical term as a 504 plan, which you can get accommodations because it's not a learning disability. It's ADHD is getting in the way of learning. So that could be something like accommodations, like, and some of the people with IEPs can get it as well too, you know, an untimed test, sitting to the front of the room, preferential seating. Um, if you have, you know, if the teacher gives 30 math problems and, you know, your child can do half of them, because if they know how to do the problems, you can tell whether they do 15 or 30 of them. There's all these accommodations that your child can get with a 504 plan. And sometimes your child may get an IEP if the ADHD is so severe that it really is impacting um, learning, they may get it. And, and that doesn't happen that much, and it depends on the school system. So that's really what an IEP is. It's a plan. It's an assessment. The learning, they look at all the learning, and they compare the standards to where your child should be. Like maybe your child's on a, uh, in fifth grade, but they're on a third grade reading level. So all the testing would determine where they are academically and socially, and then they would set up the IEP to have interventions to meet your child where they are. Somebody um, uh, who does have a Section 504 plan um, asks, uh, sh uh, they have a, an 11-year-old son who struggles and gets very frustrated with having to do homework after school. Mm -hmm. um, 504 plan. Should uh, this parent ask the teacher to allow him to not do homework? That, you know, what, what happens here, and I feel very strongly about this, is, you know, mental health is very important. Your child cannot be doing homework, coming home from school and up till midnight doing homework. There's, that's no quality of life. You're going to get depression and anxiety, and then pretty soon you could be on medication for that. So I would not say no homework, but I would say definitely reduced um and i don't know if your child's on medication if that has to be adjusted you know there's problems with staying up at night and all that but maybe they need a little baby dose of medication to get through the homework they call it a baby dose um, you can ask your doctor but definitely um if if you, and if you're reteaching your child that's a problem you shouldn't be reteaching your child it should be homework reinforcement if you feel like your child doesn't understand it and it's like they just don't know how to do the reinforcement, which is homework, then that needs to be addressed in school and that can't be sent home. Then the homework has to be altered to meet them where they are. And it may need to be altered for the homework load because again, I don't know you, but you can't, and your child's 11, so it's like 10 minutes per grade level. What is that, fifth grade? Maybe no more of an hour of homework. Um, and many of these kids are doing three, four, five, they're just, and it's just not okay. So you need to get it reduced. And, and, and with the other things that I just said, put that in combination. Um, should I give the school a few more weeks before I contact them again? Um, I have sent them emails after my kids are seated in the back of the large classroom and couldn't even see the board, even though it's on the IEP for them to sit near the front. Um, I'm confused with what's going on, and the special education teacher said she is confused, and the best support we can provide for the children right now is to make them understand that there is no proper structure yet. However, we still, we will have to take one week at a time, one day at a time, and there should be no panic or stress as long as you're participating in class and they are in class. Uh, scheduled both of them at the same time to meet with her, even though the daughter needs help in math and the son with dyslexia. So was yeah, concern. this is tough because there, again, uh, you, you want to get these academics going, but it sounds like the teacher, if the teacher said, you know, we don't, they're not really set up yet with structures, I, I, that's what I'm surmising. So it sounds like they're doing all that relationship, social, emotional learning. If, if that's what the teacher said that, you know, we really don't have a structure down yet or whatnot, I don't know if it's a new teacher. Um, it's hard because, you know, I would send this paper in um, and I would definitely tailor it to what your needs are. Um, it's been a couple weeks. Unfortunately, you're probably going to have to wait academically. 
it's not ideal, but with what's going on, yeah. And uh, is your child being held accountable? I would want to know. Getting grades? Or, you know, is, is the work suffering? I mean, is there enough work that the work's suffering to warrant this? Or is it truly like, you know, relationship building and emotional and all that? I guess it would depend on what, what you're seeing academically and how it's being held accountable for. Thank and then you. D then you definitely need to be moved to the front of the room. I went outside of the school to have my son evaluated. Um, the school told me that there were children with more needs than mine. Well, that's just too bad. <laughs> Uh, no. So do you, if you have to have an IEP. I, I don't even know if you got a diagnosis that you went outside. That evaluation needs to be looked at. You are entitled to an evaluation. Uh, it sounds like you might have paid for it. it that's an unacceptable answer. Okay, so you need to, to, to talk to the school and um, find out, you know, where that's coming from and, you know, are they following the IEP? Are they following the diagnosis? Because that is that's just not okay, and your child your child is entitled. You you may have to get an advocate. Um, what I would usually recommend is writing a letter. I would try to call first and see where they're coming from. If you can forge that territory together, um, and try not to be mad, and 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 try to give it a, a good old try there, and um, and then you may just want to send a letter, a registered letter, after that if you're not getting anywhere to the child study team and have them sign it and get the letter and see if you can get any movement because a lot of them are afraid of a lawsuit. But that's an unacceptable answer. And make sure that you're really understanding what they're saying when they say that. I think you need to talk face to face. What does that exactly mean that the children have other needs? Will you be following the IEP or not? Or, you know, you need more clarification on that. Uh, there's not one si size that fits all. Um, yeah. Accommodation might work for one and one mi accommodation might not work for another person. Right. So where would some, where, where would a parent go um, to look for accommodations or um, interventions that they might I would ask? go to Rights Law online. Okay. And I'm sure you have stuff too, but I would go to Rights Law, W-R-I-G-H-T-S Law, and you'll, you'll get a lot of accommodations there. And you can also Google it, um, but yeah, I would start. And you can also go to the 504 plan coordinator of the school. They, not everybody knows that they do have a person that does that. And I, I do want to reemphasize your earlier point where um, also talking to the teacher about things that have worked in the past for others. Yes. So a place to start. Absolutely. Because uh, they may, ha may have tricks up their sleeve that you just don't right. know. Right, and why, why, you know, if you already know, why, do you know, just cut to the chase and do it instead of finding out the hard way and figuring things out. Just go, if it's not fixed, what is it? If it's not broken, don't fix it. Or if you know what the, the patch is. Right. My daughter has been working uh, seven days a week, late nights to finish her homework. Um, she is now in 10th grade and in honors class. Um, she has so many min missing assignments because of uh, number the number of questions. I was wondering if reducing reducing homework is an option. And they may and I don't even know if the school knows that she's in honors. They might just think that you know she's doing this, and they may not know the hardship. I don't know. Um, so make sure that they know that this is the hardship, and this is not good for mental, emotional health, and self esteem and confidence. Um, and obviously, she's very bright. She's in honors classes, so um, they need to know. They definitely need to know and they need to work with you. And I, I don't get from you, I don't know if your question, if they if they know that she's struggling this much or not. Um, so before we wrap up for today, um, or is there anything else that you wanted to add or, or share with everybody? I just wanna encourage everybody because I can hear from the questions that the hard stuff is happening already and you don't know what to do and you're stressed out. And again, just remember that you know, everybody's stressed out. And I know you want to get to these educational goals. Um, give them a little bit of time and just try to go easy on yourself because the more you relax, it's the old oxygen mask. I can't think of the other one. You know, when you take, when you're less stressed, your kids are less stressed. And um, that, you know, try just to, to try to communicate with the teachers and, you know, 
send some hand lotion in or something. I know that sounds silly and that sounds trite and that sounds, but it goes a long way when teachers feel that, because I was a teacher for many years. And when, and when you're overwhelmed, you do feel like, you know, oh, I can't breathe. It's a hard job, but your kids also have rights as well. That's my email, Linda at AdvantagesLearningCenter.com with two Ds, because I say it's an advantage. And um, just put Chad presentation in the subject line, please, because then I'll know um, that that's what this is about and I can answer you better. You can ask me for that link and I'll send you the link so you can adjust this, this uh, profile and you can uh, send that into the child's teacher. Um, and here's the website if you need more information about anything. Um, and this Facebook group is, you know, you can, I manage this Facebook group. So you can also ask questions in there and you can get the help from other parents as well because it's not just NVLD. It's for neurodivergent as well. Thank you, Ms. Kranzlis. This was very, very um, informative. Everybody's saying thank you. Um, and they're very appreciative of this information. Oh, I really hope it helps. I have a lot of empathy and I love what I do. This is why I eat and breathe and live because I was one of those kids, you yeah. know, and I get it. I get it. So I know exactly where you're coming from in the trenches with you.